Um, have a warm welcome for Jennifer. Thank you very much. <laughs> Woo! Good morning. How's everybody doing? We'll let everybody kind of get seated. Sneak in the door awkwardly. <laughs> All right, um, so let's get started talking about this tool called Pally. Has anybody heard of? Couple, okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, so I wanna say thank you to all the sponsors and organizers for putting on a conference like this. I don't know if you realize how much work actually goes into putting on conferences, but it's a lot. So say thank you to the sponsors for keeping the ticket prices reasonable, um, for making things right for the speakers, uh, and definitely hug your organizers. They put in a lot of unsung work to make this happen. Um, also MCs, yes. Uh, buy him a drink later. <laughs> Um, a little bit about me, you can follow me on Twitter at like OMG, it's Fetty. I'm a JavaScript developer at a consulting company in the US called Batovi. I do a lot of speaking and I also, uh, when I'm home, brew kombucha, so. A little bit about me. Uh, and then as he mentioned, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. It's actually in a different state, it's not in Kansas, it's not in Missouri, so that's where I am, so we can just get that question out of the way because I get it all the time. Uh, we're also most famous for our export, Paul Rudd who did not fly up Thanos' butt to win the movie. Avengers, anybody? Okay, <laughs> got, a, got a couple Avengers people in the crowd. Anyway, uh, one of the things that we were requested to do was pack a shirt, but I'm actually in Europe for three weeks doing a couple different conferences and could not fit all my shirts in a carry-on. Uh, so on my slide, this is the shirt I would have worn, which says, assume all women are technical and capable of breathing fire. And so it's a good shirt um, to wear at conferences to remind you that the women here might actually write code, so keep that in mind um, and try not to make us breathe fire. Yeah! Um, and I'll post a link to my slides at the end, but if you're interested in actually buying this shirt from Cotton Bureau, the link is there. Okay, moving on. Let's actually talk about accessibility and why you should care. Um, so when we start to look at accessibility and, and the people that it affects, these are statistics based on Americans. And if we look at um, our whole population, <clears throat> uh, we only see a small part of, part of them as visually impaired. And you're like, okay, like if that many of my users can't see my website, do I really care? Um, but then when we look at hearing impaired Amer Americans in this case, um, we've still got a, a significant, significant part there that could have issues affecting their ability to use our websites and applications if you have some sort of audio content. Um, and then physically impaired, we have people who might have motor control issues or something going on where they can't read our websites. Uh, and when you start to put those numbers together, we are now looking at a significant part of a population that is unable to use your website. And so if you are trying to you know, argue for this inside of your company, why you should do accessibility testing, why you should make your applications and website accessible, this is a large market share you're missing out on. At the end of the day, those are dollars your company is losing from people unable to use your website. And so that can be a really helpful way to uh, get people at your company, especially business, to understand that accessibility is important and is something we need to be prioritizing in sprints. It's something that we need to be prioritizing as developers, as designers. Okay, so if you haven't heard this term alley before, uh, it's shorthand for accessibility, which is a measure of a computer system's accessibility to all people, um, including those with disabilities or impairments. And this uh, this has something to do with both software and hardware. So not only the websites we're designing, but actual hard pieces that we're interacting with. Um, so if you're doing Arduinos or particle um, products or things like that, those are considerations as well. Uh, when we want to kind of understand what's going on with accessibility, there are several issues to be aware of. Um, first of all, visual impairments, and I feel like that's a really easy one to understand. We kind of can uh, tell when somebody is blind, they're not going to be able to interact with our website. Uh, color blindness is another thing to consider. Certain people have different levels of color blindness that affect foreground and background and what they're able to see. Uh, we actually have this really cool contraster, contrast checker that you can use online. Um, oh, sad face. Okay, that's fine, my link didn't work. Um, I will fix that before I push these slides. But uh, you can actually use this tool, and so as you're going through and evaluating your websites for accessibility, uh, this is gonna give you a contrast ratio, and so you can change the foreground and background color to get the results you need, so that can be really, really helpful. 
Uh, auditory impairments, things to consider. There are people with deafness or partial deafness. So if you're relying on video content, it's going to be really helpful to have audio, um, audio subtitles and that kind of thing. Uh, motor impairments are something I think we don't think about a lot as developers, um, but physical impairments. So people who actually have physical disabilities. I also like to joke new parents kind of fall into this category because they've got a baby in one arm, right? And they're trying to do everything with the other. Um, so it's really important to consider if somebody does not have full functionality of hand on mouse, hand on keyboard to be able to use their website, your website, can they still do it? Um, age, another thing to consider, like if you have some sort of elderly grandparent and they struggle or trying to click an icon on an iPad or something like that, those are other considerations we need for accessible websites. Uh, you may not realize that people have diseases um, that are actually going to affect their motor control as well. Uh, they may not be able to use a mouse to navigate your website in the way that you would expect a normal user to. <clears throat> and just some general other considerations. Uh, we've got mobile devices, and some of the things that we don't necessarily think about are slow internet connectivity. Um, somebody was actually explaining to me why I have like absolutely no data service in Germany, because apparently it's a big political issue. But that is something to consider in serving your websites. Uh, if you have somebody who is unable to use it because they don't have enough data, like you need to be looking into progressive web application solutions and things like that to make sure that your websites and applications are accessible even via slow internet. Um, you need to be aware that some people might have certain settings on their mobile devices where they're zooming in the text really well, and if your content does not scale for that to work, uh, that can be uh, <clears throat> something that you need to be aware of to fix. Um, so we've got kind of this accessibility checklist, and some of these might be familiar where we've got this idea of landmark roles, and those are kind of telling you user what content pieces of a page are, whether it's a header, whether it's the main body content, whether it's some sort of navigation. Um, we've got our language attribute, which is really, really important that it matches the language your content is written in. Uh, because if you're going to a website in a different language, if they don't have that tag set, then it's not going to be able to be translated properly. And if we can't read the text, then again, we're going to have accessibility issues. Um, semantic headings, which I know sometimes we can be really, really lazy about, because we definitely don't want to have to like write CSS to change it to make it matter, but um, semantic headings using h1, h2, h3, and p tags in order in a way that makes sense do really matter for accessibility. Um, ensuring our links have focus states uh, where a user can actually tell that something is a link and it's interactable is important to consider. Uh, image alt text always gets me. I'm really bad at remembering to put that in. Um, making sure that our forms are accessible in a way that's expected. Like, I don't know if you've ever been operating a website and you try and hit the tab button because you're trying to get through fields really quick and they don't have their tab set up properly and it's just infuriating. That kind of thing matters. Um, as well as color contrast, the ability for a screen reader to be able to use your website, as well as um, a, just a keyboard navigation to be able to do everything. Um, and these, these accessibility guidelines are governed by a couple different standards. Uh, the cool thing about PALI is that it covers a vast majority of these standards, and so we'll kind of talk through a couple of them to kind of um, understand exactly what PALI is going to be testing for so you have that context. Um, first of all, we've uh, got the Worldwide Consortium Guidelines. Uh, they have the 2.1, which is updated as of June 5th, 2018. Um, so if you've been familiar with, but you didn't realize there's an update, this has a lot to do with um, mobile accessibility, um, content scaling, and things like that. Uh, but these entire guidelines are available online. <clears throat> Uh, but the first kind of key concept is we want to make sure that our content is perceivable. Uh, that means we've got text alternatives for non-text content. So if we've got an image, we want to make sure that we have some sort of alt text for what's going on. Um, we want alternatives for time-based media. We want to make sure that our content can be created or presented in different ways. So as we're scaling a page, that it's making sense. Um, and making sure that users can actually tell what's going on. So if we've got some sort of background, we want to make sure that the font on it is readable from whatever that may be. Mm -mm. Uh, some of the newer standards talk about being adaptable. Uh, so when we talk about something like a meaningful sequence, that means as we're scaling, as we're doing responsive design, that the content is still going to be laid out in a meaningful way that makes sense to a user. They're going to expect the navigation to be at the top and have some sort of accessible menu, that kind of thing. Um, as well as making sure that we're identifying purpose. And so that's labeling icons and inputs and regions uh, so as a user navigates, they understand what's going on. We also have distinguishable, and so this really goes more in depth uh, talking about non-text con non contrast. Um, so even if you have different images or other things that aren't strictly um, just text that you have on the page, that you can distinguish those, um, as well as spacing and content that has some sort of hover or focus interactiveness.
Uh, the next kind of key uh, idea behind uh, these accessibility guidelines are everything needs to be operable. Again, needs to be available from a keyboard. Um, providers need to have enough time. So if you've got some sort of auto scrolling on your website or you're doing some sort of effect like that, you need to make sure that um, your content is accessible for any level reader who's going to take time. <clears throat> I like to joke about this one, um, don't design content in a way that's known to cause seizures. Uh, so back home in the States, I run a chapter of Coder Dojo, which is a nonprofit teaching kids how to code. And I don't know what it is about like kids that are six years old, but they're like, I'm going to make a really bright colored website that gives people seizures. And you're like, like, you know, shit that only six-year-olds care about. But um, it is important to know that uh, we don't want to design content that's going to be doing that kind of flash thing, because there are people that are triggered by that. Um, <clears throat> And then again, uh, find ways to help users navigate and find content and determine where we are. Uh, at my job, I do a lot of consulting and training. And so we're actually building out this very large training page. And sometimes we'll have like six or seven exercises on a page. And there's a lot of content to scroll through. And one of the things we've done is built like a secondary navigation that actually tracks where you are on the page as you scroll. Um, so using utilities like that to help your users can be really helpful. Uh, we also want to make sure that everything is understandable, so that content is readable. Uh, you might need to get your copy editors involved in this. Um, <clears throat> You want to make your web pages appear and operate in predictable ways. And so uh, I know we've kind of uh, moved away from like parallax was a big deal a couple of years ago, and that was a new big thing, or doing all this crazy stuff for the user. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make a website accessible or lead to a best experience as flashy and as much as the designers like it. Um, so we need to be considerate of that. Um, and finally, it needs to be robust. And so that means uh, technology changes. The way we use technology changes. Devices change. And so part of uh, making accessible websites me means being always aware of this technology that changes and making sure that we're continuously making accessibility updates regardless of what that, or that technology change means. Uh, we've got a couple different levels of these standards, and you might be thinking, OK, A, AA, AAA, what does that mean? And these are basically um, accessibility levels. And so the, the basic level, level A, is the most compliance you have. And that's you're going to check every um, accessibility box and just do the, the bare minimum. Um, and then level AAA is the highest. And so that can sometimes mean more complex, robust accessibility solutions that are more than just providing um, an alt text for an image tag. Uh, I like to show this as a joke uh, because this is what we have to do according to the US government. And this is the documentation they provide us to make websites accessible. Uh, and it is just a dumpster fire of text. It's like, what? OK, page shall be designed to avoid causing the screen to flicker with a frequency greater than 2 hertz and lower than, like, what? What? How do I, ah, what do I do with this? And I feel like uh, this is kind of a good example of why you don't see people implementing accessibility is because they, are, they go in and they're like, all right, let's make this accessible. And then they go in and they start reading the text. And they're like, what the hell does this mean? Like, I don't, I don't understand. I already have to do this. I have to refactor this code. I haven't even like reviewed this pull request yet. I just, I've got too much other stuff on my plate to figure out how to decipher all this like mumbo jumbo legal crap. Like, seriously, nobody has time for that. All right, so that is why I'm so excited about Pally. Uh, not the hero we need, but the hero we deserve. And the great thing is it's going to catch all this stuff for us. It is smart enough to know and understand. OK, well, technically, the people who wrote it are smart enough to know and understand these accessibility guidelines. Uh, and then we can use this tool to test all these different things and catch and figure out what errors we need to figure out. Um, but it's an automated accessibility testing pal. Uh, the important thing to know is it runs HTML code sniffer um, from the command line, and that's what it's going to do to generate its reports. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple different interfaces or ways you can interact with it, but that's the GitHub repo um, <clears throat> if you want to take a photo of it now or I'll have it available later. Um, the other important thing to know is uh, the current version of Pally uses Puppeteer, and it's going to launch a browser instance, and then it's going to run um, tests defined by your JavaScript interface. Um, so this is going to allow us to uh, crawl you know, websites uh, that are built using Neos. We can crawl single page applications, um, anything we want to do. And so the, the important thing to keep in mind is like, yes, at, um, Pally runs accessibility tests for us, but all it is doing is launching Puppeteer and reading your page. And so sometimes I feel like people get hung up on that. So if you can think about that, that'll help you a lot. 
So let's look at actually testing some websites. And sorry, conference organizers, I'm about to throw you under the bus. Uh, let's look at what happens. Um, so I already have uh, Pally installed on my computer. Um, so if we just run it from the command line, and if I can type properly, sorry, my fingers are like freezing. Um, we've got a couple different options here. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, find out what kind of accessibility errors the Neos conference website has. Uh -oh. Um, so this is going to go ahead and just run out of the command line. Um, it's going ahead and uh, launching that Puppeteer instance. And then it's giving us this output log of all these different errors. Busted! <laughs> I, I do this to every conference I'm at, so like, don't feel bad. Uh, we can fix it. Uh, so yes, lots of errors going on here. And I'm not going to scroll up to the top because I'm too lazy for that right now. Um, but a couple things to understand. Like, Let's look at this error. Can you, can you all read that OK? Yeah, OK. Um, uh, so this element has insufficient contrast at this um, conformance level. Expected a contrast ratio of at least uh, 4.5 to 1, but text in this element um, has a ratio of 2.56 to 1. So that tool that I showed you that you can do contrast text checking is really, really helpful in this scenario. So you can go and plug in the colors that it's giving you and figure out what you need. Um, and sorry, this doesn't I don't have a good setup for my um, terminal right now because I've been switching to VS Code. But um, this is actually going to tell you what guideline is failing, so if you need to go and look it up in the documentation to get a better understanding of what's going on that's there. Um, and then it's going to actually give us whatever this offending element is on the page. So it's telling us, OK, it's inside of the main content um, ID div, inside a div, inside a section, inside that eighth child of the section, da 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 da. Um, and then it's giving us what the actual um, element is there. And so in this case, it looks like a button with content that says Discover Dresden. Um, and so that way, we can go through and figure out where our errors are and, and begin to correct them. Uh, so we can do a couple other things. Um, so this is obviously just printing out to the command line, which you know it's a cool party trick, uh, but not actually that useful. Uh, we can do a couple other things with uh, reporters. <clears throat> um, I, I will stop throwing. Uh, NeosConf under the bus. Uh, but we can actually uh, generate HTML reports with this. And so we can set a report command uh, or a report flag, excuse me, let us know what report kind that is, and then tell the file name what it's going to be. And then instead of all that output that we saw in our terminal, that's going to package it nicely for us in an HTML file. You can export to CSV. You can export to TSV. Um, so all sorts of different options there. And so then if we open our file, uh, it is so hard to type with very cold fingers. Um, this is what that's going to look like. Uh, so again, it'll give us all that output. Um, and this is not super easy to read, but don't worry. I will show you how to create a pretty custom dashboard, and it will be amazing. All right. Uh, back to our slides. OK. Uh, so again, Pelly CLI, fun, uh, but not really useful in a typical workflow. Um, so basically, if you just need to run a quick test on something, that kind of thing. Um, has anybody heard of like Axe or Lighthouse? Yeah, OK, so kind of similar concept there, where you're going to launch some sort of accessibility testing um, extension in your browser and get output there. That's about what Pally CLI amounts to. Um, from the CLI, we can run an accessibility test against a URL. Like I showed you, we can use a reported output results to a file. Um, a couple other things we can do, we can um, choose whichever accessibility rule set. Like, y'all aren't going to care about Section 508 because that's a US thing, and so you don't need to see any errors regarding that, um, I guess, unless you're serving content that is somehow connected to the US government, and then you will care. But um, you can also choose to ignore certain warnings and notices. So if you only want to show like a certain error level, you can set that flag. Um, <clears throat> OK, uh, so uh, the CI interface uh, can do everything that the CLI can do. Uh, but the cool thing about this is you can integrate it into your development workflow. And so if you want to integrate this with Travis um, CI or something like that, you can actually set a fail threshold of tests. So let's say you have five accessibility tests fail. You can stop the build and then not let that pass until you go through and ex uh, fix those accessibility issues. Um, so that can be really, really helpful for integrating into your workflow and actually making this a very useful tool.
Uh, that output is going to look like this. We are going to have a uh, PALI CI file that lives in you know whatever directory that you are going to be um, running your test from, or if you've got some sort of integrated build process, you would want to put it in there. Uh, the way to consider this is similar to how you would write end-to-end -end tests. Because um, you're going to be doing something very similar with a screen call crawler. And so if you can kind of like mentally put that in that category, um, as far as your testing and setup and automation goes, that's where that should live. Um, and then for your fail threshold, that is how you would define that um, when you're running this command. So if you've got like your Travis YAML file or something like that, you would just put this command in with whatever you determine your fail threshold to be um, and call that good. OK. Um, the most practical way, I think, is actually using the JavaScript interface, which is where we can write some really robust test files. Um, and this gives us a lot more um, ability to kind of uh, run more end-to-end -end like tests and make the changes that we need to happen in the browser to do all the accessibility testing we'll need. Um, the result output is going to look a little bit something like this. And so it's basically what you all saw in the command line where we're going to have um, the document title, whatever we were testing, whatever the page URL was, because we feed um, Pally page URLs to test against, uh, whatever the violation that it has according to the guidelines that you have set, um, the context of the error being wherever, um, whatever element that is the offensive or failing accessibility test. Um, what the message is, and so this is going to be human readable, hey, this is the problem, this is what you need to fix. Uh, the selector, wherever it's located in the page, and whether it's an error, an info, or a warning, um, and then a type code. So it's important to understand what the result output looks like, and that way you can begin to use it and write whatever test you need, and, um, output it into whatever reports you need. OK, uh, we're going to run through some of the bigger pieces of the API real quick. Um, we can do async await. So if we ever are needing to await things to happen in our applications, we can use that. Uh, we have actions, and so these can be really helpful. And I'll show you this in a demo in a minute. Um, if you have some sort of interactivity on a screen that you need to happen, like maybe you have a multi-step UI and you need to click and run an accessibility test and then click to get to the next part of the UI and run an accessibility test, that's how you would do. Um, and it's important to know that these instructions are going to be run before your PALI tests are run. So you're going to have an action, and then the test will run. If you need to um, go and then do the same URL and do another set of actions and then run your test, that's how that'll work. Mm -mm. You can also verify actions, um, because if you try and click an element on a page that doesn't exist, your tests are going to error out. Um, so you can double check that an action is valid. Like we can submit, an, or we can click an element that has an ID of submit. Uh, drinking more champagne is not a valid action, which is unfortunate. Uh, we can also hide elements. So let's say you have some sort of third-party integration on your website. Um, you can ignore whatever that you um, don't care about because it's not code that you're maintaining. Uh, you can ignore certain warnings or certain rule sets. So again, like I mentioned, you all don't care about Section 508, so you can ignore that. Um, you can update your log information. Uh, if you just want to see your errors, you can do that. If you want a little bit more information or context to uh, do debugging, you can use info. Um, you can set different page headers. So if you're testing an application that is relying on cookies to serve content, you can set that before. Uh, we talked about testing content that is responsive. And so you can actually set different viewport sizes. So you can test like a full page view. You can um, test a mobile view. <clears throat> um, set your rule standards. Uh, and then this is the most helpful one you can do. You can actually do screen captures. And so a lot of times, because you're, you're working in headless Chrome, you don't have a visual of what's happening, and you can forget about things. Taking a screen capture will actually photograph what's happening at that exact moment in time. So that can be a really helpful debugging tip. Um, we've got timeout and wait. So if you're waiting on content or you want to set a, um, a certain amount of time to pass in the wait function before your tests fail, you can do that. Um, so let's look at testing some more websites. And so I have this joke website that I have built. Um, if you've seen the show Gossip Girl, um, I, I, I'm into theming talks right now. So this is my Gossip Girl theme talk. Um, but so I've built this sample website. And this is what we're going to be running some accessibility tests against. Um, so uh, <laughs> this background is atrocious. Hello, 90s. Uh, but so that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, and I've got this repo available online, so all these code snippets will be available for you. But the first thing we've got is this basic test that I've written. And I'm just going to text the index page, and then I'm going to be clicking this button, because I want to get rid of this modal to text the, co 
test the content underneath. Uh, so that's an example of using actions. Uh, I've got a couple different things happening. I am doing a screen capture that's just dumping it into the directory I'm running this out of and titling it what. Um, and then I am writing my results to this um, custom HTML file that I've created. Um, so if I want to go ahead and run that, uh, Here's our basic example. Uh, so it's going to go ahead and give us some output, letting us know what's happening. OK, let me know that it ran the test on the page, it captured the screen, and saved that. Um, so now in my code base, I can see um, it, it gave me the screenshot of exactly where that was. Um, and then I can take a look at uh, where I outputted that file to. And that's what that's going to look like. And so we've, now we've got some uh, nicer formatting in CSS that can make this really easable, really, excuse me, usable. Um, so we've got, we've got a lot of tests to run and figure out what's going on and solve our, our errors. This can be a really nice way to view that. OK, uh, and then let's say we have a really complex, robust website. We've just got a ton of different examples to hit. Um, I've got this custom report that I've written. And essentially, um, I have an array of all the different pages that I want to test. If I have any test options available um, or actions that I need, I'm going to go ahead and paste that in. Uh, so in this case, I'm testing just like the main URL. I'm testing a post page. I'm texting, testing a specific post page. I'm te testing a PIX page and a CAS page. And so I am feeding this array to my test runner that I've written. And this is going to create like a really robust dashboard. And so again, all this code is available on GitHub if you want to pull it and use it for yourself. Um, but this can be a really nice way to go through and begin to look at more complex websites that have a lot going on to figure out how to go and begin to fix these tests. Um, so we can go ahead and run that custom report that I built. Um, and again, this is going to output everything. Um, it's going to create a main e index.html file, but then there's going to be a page for every page that I've run tests against that's going to outline all their tests against there. Um, OK, so now we've got this, and I've got a list of every page that I've run tests against. Um, I can click in. I can see whatever errors are failing in that test. I'm even giving myself a screenshot in case I don't remember what's happening. Um, and it's kind of nice that it actually takes like the entire uh, page and not just what's above the fold. So that can be really, really helpful. Uh, so many tabs now. All right, um, so this available code is available on GitHub um, at tefedeiken slash gossipgirlng. Uh, so if you want to look at how those tests are run, I also um, in my package.json have all the different commands that I wrote to make, the, um, to make that happen. So if you want to do just like the basic pally test, I've got that alias to pally basic. Um, the dashboard is at uh, pally dash. <laughs> OK, um, and if that seems like a lot of work to you, uh, there is actually already a Pally dashboard that you can integrate. Um, this does require having um, some sort of uh, database to track all your changes. Um, but this can be a really helpful tool. And it kind of gamifies it, too, because if you, as you see like less and less red tests, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm doing awesome. Um, so that can help get other people on board for accessibility testing on your team. Um, so that is how you would implement their dashboard. Uh, so recap, uh, we wrote a basic test. We were just testing one file and then outputting those results. Uh, we used actions to aid our test. So I wanted to test this page, but I wanted to click out of the modal. So I used actions to do that. Um, output results to our HTML file. Uh, we created a custom HTML file um, and a custom dashboard. And so all that code, again, is available. Uh, when it comes to arguing the business side, because you know, as developers, we need to pick and choose our battles and, and figure out what we can win, uh, a couple things to consider. Pally takes not a lot of effort to implement. Even if our website is ridden with accessibility errors, it's very easy to run Pally and be able to go boom, 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 and start fixing things. Very low-hanging fruit. Um, this is going to give us immediate improvements. We are going to be able to at least hit a lot of the basics of accessibility that we care about. Uh, this is going to help audience retention. Again, when you think to that, that segment of the population I showed you um, that is suffering from different accessibility issues, that is an audience you're going to gain with your websites and applications that you're building. Uh, you're going to get their loyalty. If your website is usable, people are going to stick around, and they're going to talk about it, and they are going to promote your product. Um, accessibility will actually also help your SEO, especially when you're considering um, looking at doing more semantic markup and appropriate tagging. Those are things that the Google search 
search engine actually indexes. Um, so it's good to be aware. And if you're arguing to get more time spent on accessibility testing, you'll be like, well, it'll boost our, e um, our SEO. And that'll lead to more sales. And more sales means more money, right? Yeah. Business people just always, always show them the dollars, and, and you'll get your way. Um, and most importantly, you can avoid lawsuits. Uh, I was working a couple startups ago, and my boss at the time had been working for an educational startup, and they actually got sued, and the company collapsed because they weren't accessible. Um, so it happens, like it, it's a real thing. And so if all else fails, you can just say, "Hey, we don't want to get sued. Let's make our website accessible," and hopefully, you can uh, you can get some sway that way. Um, if you have any questions, I would love you to come up and talk to me after. Um, there's my email address if you're interested in implementing this at your company. Um, take a photo of this slide because that's where the slides are available at. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, you lovely humans. Thank you so very much. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer. That was one intense talk. A lot of Not only, but also because of your talking speed. Great stuff. A lot of content. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Make your websites accessible. Thank you very much. Don't forget to vote for that talk.